Okay. Um, this is an interview for the Purdue University's Oral History Program. Today's date is October 14th, 2015. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at the Purdue University Library's Archives and Special Collections. Today I am interviewing by phone Dr. Michael Murphy. Dr. Murphy received his bachelor's degree, master's, and PhD from Purdue University. He worked in the rocket propulsion industry since graduating in 1964 and received industry recognition for his work with the Titan missile and space shuttle programs. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Also here with me is Professor Michael Smith, Purdue University History Department, and we may be joined later by Rita Baines, Director of Development and Communications, Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So thank you again, Dr. Murphy, for our um, agreeing to participate in our program. My first question for you um, is uh, where were you born and where did you grow up and what was it like? I uh, was born in Madison, Wisconsin. That's where I grew up. And I actually started my college uh, experience at the University of Wisconsin. What did you study? What were, what were you... Um... I was in uh, mechanical engineering there. Uh, I had always uh, wanted to take part in aeronautics in one form or another, actually be a pilot, but my eyes weren't good enough. Oh. Uh, Wisconsin did not have aeronautical engineering, and so eventually I ended up at Purdue. And then what... what uh, how did you end up at Purdue? What... What led you here? Well, again, my, my grandfather graduated from uh, Purdue in 03. And after school, I used to go sit talk with him. And uh, so I had that kind of subtle push <laughs> to go to Purdue. <laughs> but uh, when I could not get the aeronautical engineering at uh, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and with the push from my grandfather, I went to Purdue. Actually, uh, a lot of my family uh, is from Indiana. My grandfather's uh, sister married a man that became governor down there hmm. in Clifford Townsend. Oh, interesting. And uh, so I've got a lot of family from Purdue, or from uh, Indiana. Mm-hmm. What was high school like? Did you? I'm sure you excelled in math and science. Uh, what What made you decide engineering was aeronautical engineering? Well, uh, high school was great. I had a wonderful time. My timing was right for being there because I could take part in sports. I had a brother, still have brother. <laughs> he was a much better athlete than me, but uh, played sports. Uh, did. Uh, did well in, uh, in school. I uh, also had my sister. They went to the same high school. We went to West High School. So uh, growing up in Madison was uh, a great experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Were you ever influenced by reading science fiction or popular science or by aviation feats or space exploration discussions uh, going on in the media? No, actually, I think the biggest influence that I had was when I was five years old and I came from uh, Chicago to uh, Madison on a Northwest Airlines DC-3. Uh, five years old, I got off the airplane and I asked my parents, when, when can I get on the airplane again? <laughs> right. I actually was sick when I got off the airplane. <laughs> so there was, that kind of began... Uh, the desire to uh, be involved in aviation. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, you you got the bug then, huh? I got the bug then. Mm -hmm. Watched airplanes uh, go over. Uh, Truax Field was fairly close to where we lived, so uh, during the Second World War, a lot of the uh, B-17s and other airplanes that were being ferried uh, overseas. Uh, stopped at Truex Field and so saw him fly over. Oh. Huh. Yeah. And uh, my father was a, was an attorney. He got involved. 
Mm-hmm. So it just, I don't know, I've just always been interested in airplanes. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that it never worked out if I got into rocketry. But. <laughs> it was your uh, stepping stone, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, C- can I ask if you ever flew in and out of Purdue Airport? Did you participate in any way in that? Uh, I did learn to fly, and uh, I uh, belonged to the Aero Club there at Purdue. And so I've flown in and out of uh, Purdue Airport. I met my wife at Purdue, and uh, she, uh, she didn't like flying, so that kind of ended it for me. <laughs> What was that like? I wonder, just being a member of the Aero Club and um, spending. Oh, it was wonderful. I'd take a plane, and I'd jump, fly on home to Madison, fly back to you know, fly home for the weekend, fly back. Great experience. Wow. And in fact, I think uh, I've got a son that's a captain for uh, United Airlines. I got a nephew that's uh, first officer for United Airlines. And I've got uh, a grandson that's uh, in the Air Force uh, in flight training at uh, Vance Air Force Base, so we kind of had the airplane bug. (laughs) Did you learn to fly at Purdue, or where did you learn to fly? No, I learned uh, at a little town outside Madison called Middleton, Murray Airport. I learned there. Uh, I must have been 16, 17. I only ended up with 100 hours total. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I kid my wife and tell her I could, I could only afford one thing. I could either afford her or I could afford flying. <laughs> and then I say, and I made the wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> but no. No. It was great. Okay. It was great. So if I can ask you a few questions about what it was like uh, here at Purdue when you were here. Um, what was it like to be a student at Purdue, uh, partic- specifically uh, enrolled in the engineering program? Well, I transferred down there uh, after my uh, sophomore year at uh, Madison. And I was there for summer school, and Larry Carnino, who uh, was teaching at least class I took at summer school. Fantastic professor. He had, I think he died about four years ago. Uh, he uh, taught a, uh, the course I took in the summertime, and I forget what it was called, called but it was familiarity with aircraft and engines, et cetera. And uh, then my junior and senior years, uh, I worked out of the uh, gas turbine lab there at the airport, mm-hmm. you know, as a student. And I also became a, a what, counselor in the residence halls. Oh, you were busy. And, and finally a faculty sponsor in my graduate program down there. So I was busy, and uh, the first... Uh, Two years, I'd say I didn't do much dating. Uh, I had a girlfriend up in, in Madison, and I didn't do much dating. But then uh, I met my wife. We were living over in the State Street courts, and I don't believe they're there anymore. Mm-hmm. And I was a uh, residence hall counselor over there, and I met my wife at... Uh, dinner one night at the uh, dining room and eventually uh, several years later we got married (laughs) (laughs) so it was great (laughs) Uh, she she went to Purdue she says because at that time the ratio was uh, eight men to every woman (laughs) so she transferred down from Lawrence College in Wisconsin oh she was from Wisconsin as well (laughs) Yep. <laughs> so, um, no, it was it was a great time. How how 
was the um, the curriculum, the engineering curriculum? Was it difficult, or what do you remember the most? Well, for, for me, it was difficult. It, it, was, uh, it was more difficult on my master's degree, and uh, I can remember one time uh, I uh, took a test. Generally, the, the tests were five questions, and so, you know, each question was worth 20 points. And I took a test from Dr. Reese, and I forget exactly what the course was, but anyways, I was teaching a similar course as a teaching assistant. And I got back the test, and on top was a 20, and I thought, oh, I got the first problem right. <laughs> That was, that was a total score. Oh, no. <laughs> so I went in to see Dr. Reese, and I, I called Bruce now. I didn't at that time. I said, Dr. Reese, uh, what I would like to do is I would like to uh, withdraw from the course as soon as I get a passing grade. He said, Mike, I, I, I was worried. I didn't understand what happened to you. I didn't like you. He said, you stick with the course and we'll just throw out the first first test as long as you do well. Wow. And I ended up with an A. Wow. But, uh, you know, like most students, at times you clutch. Yeah. So, I clutched. <laughs> <laughs> now, were those classes out at the lab or were you on campus? No, we were on campus. Uh-huh. Uh, now, some of the classes were out at the Yale School. Mm -hmm. and I remember one I took from Larry Carnino was out there. I had classes from uh, George Palmer. I forget the other. Uh, well, uh, Joe Liston. Kristen Joe was my uh, major professor on my master's. Mm -hmm. What was... So, what was Professor? It was a fun time. What was Professor Palmer like? I've met him. He's very interesting. Oh, uh, he's extremely interesting. <laughs> he is a very sharp uh, person. He, I, to me, he was very personable, mm -hmm. and I remember him very well. And when I've been back at Purdue at various times, I've uh, spent time with him. Mm-hmm. So he is. He was very good with the wind tunnels and that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite memory of your time at Purdue? A favorite memory? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's one of the things you had down here later on, I believe, was uh, some practical jokes and that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's part, that was, you know, on on uh, my uh, doctorate, and uh, I was doing research with solid propellants, and so there's a little bit of hazard there, so a lot of times you spend your nights out at the lab working. And, uh, well, one night I was out there, and this was near the end of my times, uh, we went into the woman's uh, restroom, and the janitor at that time was a man named Zim. And uh, his coveralls were hanging in the uh, woman's restroom along with his boots. So we put the boots in the stall <laughs> and had the uh, uh, coveralls. So they came down over the boots and it looked like he was standing in the stall. <laughs> The next morning, uh, Jeannie Patterson was uh, Doc's secretary at that time. He'd come in, and she went into the ladies' restroom <laughs> to freshen up before starting work. Mm -hmm. And she came right out and said, well, Zim's in there. And she waited a half hour, and she went back in again. And she said, Zim's committed suicide. Oh, no. They called the university police. <laughs> well, you can imagine uh, those of us that were involved disappeared in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs>
Sounds like you. It was a fun atmosphere, but you. I'm sure you worked hard as well. Oh, oh we worked very hard, but it was a fun atmosphere, and I think it's uh, very different from the things uh, going on at the lab now. But we we had a good time. In fact, when I was down there th- this last weekend, uh, Joe Hoffman and Ron Durr and I, we reminisced a lot about the different practical jokes. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of them. Um, what uh, what rocketry projects and tests do you remember the most from your work out at the lab? Well, you know, when I got out to the lab, now I uh, came back from spending my time in, in the service, my six month tour, and uh, with Doc, well, with the lab, as I recall things. They didn't tell you what to do. You had to decide what you were going to do. Oh. And that, I think, was one of the strong points at the lab. We, were, we weren't led by the hand. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I finally decided that I'd like to do some work in solid propellants. There wasn't much going on at the lab at that time. And so... Uh, that was fine with Doc, but I had to write up the proposal. I had to go sell the program to the people out at the, the Air Force Rocket Propulsion Lab out at Edwards Air Force Base. Oh. And that, well, before <laughs> that, there was one thing I had to do, and Doc kind of required that of all students. You had to do make some contribution to the lab. Mm-hmm. And so for me... Uh, because of working with solid propellants, we had to have a storage magazine to handle uh, that. So we had this building that then was surrounded with all kinds of dirt, dirt piled over it and all, and then it was fenced in mm-hmm. so that uh, people could not get in there unless uh, they had the keys. And at that time, I had one set of keys in the university. Hmm. So, uh, in fact, one of the practical jokes with uh, had was with uh, Joe Hoffman. He gone and bought a sewing machine for his wife, and he had it sitting in his uh, TR four, I think it was. He had. I got it. hold of it. I took it. I took it out to the uh, storage magazine, and I set it up on top. <laughs> Where he could see it, <laughs> but he couldn't get in there. <laughs> so we, we laugh about it now, but at that time he was not happy, <laughs> and I think rightly so. Right, he was probably in hot water at home because. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think his wife had gotten it yet. <laughs> oh, she didn't know about it, right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, that was a good time. <laughs> um. Did, did you go out to Edwards Air Force Base to sell your proposal, or did they come here? No, we went out there. Now, Zucker was my major professor. Bob Osborne was my boss. So Osborne counseled me or whatever on how to write the proposal, and uh, he and I went out to Edwards Air Force Base. Now, Doc and Mike, you and I talked a little bit about this. Doc was uh, just a fantastic uh, professor, and I think he prepared us better than almost, uh, well, better than you would find at any other 
school because we were concentrated more on what it would take to, to run a program. I mean, we, we did research and all that, but most of us ended up in uh, program management positions in industry. And I think that uh, made things uh, very interesting. Uh, Doc came from Aerojet. And when he was at Aerojet, he worked with Martin Summerfield. Martin Summerfield became the lead man at Princeton in their propulsion work. There was a lot of competition back and forth. But uh, Doc's people ended up running programs in that, whereas uh, Summerfield's people seemed to go more into doing the, the science stuff, doing the research. Why do you think that is? I mean, what it, was it that Dr. Zucro pushed you toward that led his students in that direction? Well, I think uh, it was. It came from. Uh, his experiences with Aerojet, and when he came to Purdue, which I think was back in, it was either uh, 46 or 48, I think it was 46, and uh, he wrote a book. I got it down in the bookcase. I think it was called Jet Propulsion. And that was the first book on uh, rocketry. And at the time that... Uh, even when I was there, rocketry was still pretty new. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was there from uh, before uh, Sputnik on, but Doc uh, was getting a lot of money from uh, the National Science Foundation and from other government agencies to uh, do the research, to build the facilities, et cetera, at Purdue. Mm -hmm. I think it was just his background from his experience at uh, Aerojet. Mm -hmm. What might have accounted for that competition with Martin Summerfield J just beyond? Uh, they, they were doing work in combustion instability. Purdue was doing work in combustion instability. And uh, Summerfield was... Uh, editor of that time of the Journal of the American Rocket Society. And uh, Doc Sucro and uh, Dr. Osborne had done a paper on uh, combustion instability, and it was published in uh, the Journal of the American Rocket Society, and it was critiqued at the same time. Summerfield and people back there. I think it was Lu Luigi Crocco was also a professor at that time. And they couldn't understand how Purdue could write a paper on combustion instability that proposed things differently than they had. And I think that was where things started to get kind of hot. Because Summerfield should have stayed neutral as the editor. Hmm. They went back, uh, Zucro and Summerfield, to Aerojet too. So were the relations good between them before that moment? I really don't know. I don't know because that was before my time. Dr. Reese might be able to answer that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. They, they were both strong personalities. Summerfield perhaps. Oh, extremely strong. Yeah. But in looking back, from my point of view, uh, I uh, have the feeling that uh, Zucro was much, much better. Now, from my experience, I would say Zucro was to academics what Dr. Von Braun was to uh, industry and the government. And it was funny, I was uh, working a proposal oh, four or five years ago, and the man that was going to 
to be my lead propulsion man, uh, Dr. Rudy Wasey, who graduated from Princeton. And he says, you know, Mike, and I think you've probably seen this in, out the lab, but uh, he says, you know, you guys from Purdue all had gold balls. We didn't. <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen the picture in the conference room out there, but there's a picture of Doc and his Titac has two gold balls on it. But the feeling was that uh, somehow we were favored over the Princeton guys. <laughs> and if you and look at things now, Princeton's not doing much in the propulsion area. They had an outstanding lab, but you don't hear much about it anymore. So, so you, you look at uh, what uh, Steve Heaster's done at the lab. He, he was kind of, uh, oh, I was just, I think the lab went downhill when Doc retired. Well, the lab now is probably the finest research facility in the country for propulsion, if not in the world. I'm not at all biased, you can tell that. <laughs> right. Um, I want to follow up on something you just said. Um, so to what extent uh, did Dr. Zucro uh, help you and, and maybe some of your other classmates secure your first job or later jobs? And it's the, his reputation sort of helped. Oh, his, his reputation helped. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, uh, my first job out of school was with uh, Thiokol down in Huntsville. And uh, I had narrowed things down to three spots that I consider working. One was Mark Marietta, one was uh, Thiokol, and one was the University of uh, Oklahoma. And I decided, well, if you're going to be a university professor, you ought to have a bunch of experience in what you're teaching and all that. And I mm -hmm. figured out, well, I didn't have enough experience there. Uh, Martin, Martin Company, I'd always been interested in because of their airplanes. But I finally uh, went to Thiokol, uh, one, because uh, I'd spent some uh, reserve tours down there with the Army at the uh, Army Propulsion Lab, and two, uh, because uh, Zucco and Osborne were consultants for Thiokol. So mm -hmm. I figured I'd have it pretty well made. Mm -hmm. So that's where I went. Zucco, mm -hmm. uh, well, I have another little story. Uh, in 60, when uh, Nixon was running for president, I was uh, very interested in Nixon. <laughs> and Doc came by and says, Mike, you don't understand. He says, I lived out in California, and he's not the kind of guy you want for president. Well, I thought... My days at Purdue are numbered. <laughs> so I went job hunting at that time. Uh, of course, I ended up staying at Purdue. And I misjudged uh, Doc badly at that time. Well, I hadn't been there that long. Mm -hmm. So I'd maybe been there a few months. Mm -hmm. But it was... No, Doc was amazing. And then... Uh, came out here, uh, maybe I've been here two or three years, calls me, he's coming out, he wants to get together with me, and then he wants to know how old my kids are, because he brought them all presents. Oh, wow. Uh, he was just a neat, neat man. And I can remember a number of times when I'd have to get up in front of him or defending my dissertation or whatever, and we had to do... We had to present papers and stuff. He made us get up and do a lot of the stuff that we ended up doing in industry. Mm -hmm. But I'd get up and I'd be kind of nervous. He'd say, Mike, who's the one that's done all the work on your subject? You are. You know more about it than anybody else. You don't need to be nervous. <laughs> so, no, a lot of lessons I learned from him, and I'm sure that was true with his other students. 
So he was an excellent teacher in that regard, and oh, pre yeah. preparing you for, for your career? Yes, yes. absolutely. Well, for uh, our career, uh, what he, I already said some of this, uh, he, we were required, as I told you, to perform a task for the lab prior to doing our research. That's when I built the solid propellant storage magazine. Doc required us to write proposals to our customer and we get assistance like I did from Bob Osborne. Mm -hmm. Doc required us to write papers for national meetings as well as publications. He reviewed our writings many, many times. Hmm. I, I'd write something take it to him, no, 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 you got to change this and that. So you go back and change things. And then you go back and see him again, then he finds something else. <laughs> but it was uh, very, very good. He also had us making presentations at the lab to the individuals who funded our programs. So we got a lot of experience. benefited us later on, and that's why I think so many of us uh, were in uh, uh, leadership positions. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, I think the preparation of the papers and the presentations became key things for us because it made us better communicators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that Doc emphasized. And I think that's one of the reasons that you find so many of his students did well mm -hmm. when they got out into industry. A any idea where he came by that? Where he learned the you know this skill? I don't know. You know, he came to this country when I think he was eight years old. He came from uh, from Russia, and. Uh, you know, he ended up having the first uh, PhD in engineering that uh, Purdue awarded. Mm -hmm. But I, I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, Dr. Reese might be able to answer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Because um, Bruce was there, what, 12 years before I was. Hmm. And then... Um, did you learn, how did you learn Russian? Did you learn Russian at the lab or at, at, at Purdue classes or a tutor? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting story. <laughs> when I first started my doctorate, the first course I took was in Russian. Hmm. Maybe you don't want to take, well. <laughs> and uh, three and a half years later or whatever, when I'm getting ready to leave, still taking Russian. <laughs> and my Russian professor says, Mike, you know, I'm awfully tired of seeing you. <laughs> what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you this, whatever it was I was going to have to translate. He says, you take that home and you memorize it and all that. And that's what I'm going to give you for your test. So that I can say you passed. <laughs> We're not going to tell anybody what I've done. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> and after that, I uh, I did a number of things with the uh, Air Force uh, Foreign Technology Division, and uh, had to know Russian. Well, I, <laughs> I could translate. Cause you got a book there with you, but I could not speak it. Mm -hmm. And I uh, traveled some for the Air Force and uh, went to conferences and had a number of Russians that I got to know fairly well, but they all spoke English. Mm -hmm. so. did, did you find that y your ability to translate from Russian was unique in, in your profession? Were there others who could do oh, I think there were others, yeah. you'd find 
behind the Russians and the Americans and other countries presenting papers. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, move on to talk a little, ask you some questions about your career. Yes. Um, could you please um, tell us about your first job after graduating from Purdue? Okay, my first uh, job after Purdue was with Thiokol Chemical down in Huntsville, Alabama. And what I did down there, uh, pretty rapidly, because I was only down there two and a half years, I uh, got involved with what they call ducted rockets. I was going to ask you what was the what was the the, the lesson hmm, that you took away from that, but <laughs> yeah, you you can be replaced. Don't, don't ever make yourself indispensable or think you're indispensable. Yeah. So, 
So you. It didn't happen. <laughs> so that was around, you were there at Viacol 1964, 66? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I left about in, uh, I think it was June of 66. I started working for Viacol Channel 3 in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And that was right at the height of the, the space race. What was it like to be an engineer during the, those years of the 60s? Oh, it, it was wonderful. Now, uh, when I was down in, in Huntsville, of course, Dr. Von Braun was down there then. And after I'd left, but uh, he, when I was in the, the Army, I was in the Corps of Engineers, and I was out of Fort Belvoir, and once I'd gone through a BOMOP, Basic Officer Military Orientation Program, then I was assigned there to Fort Belvoir to support uh, Dr. Von Braun with Corps of Engineer items. But it was just at that time that he was then appointed Director of Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh -huh. So it was an exciting time, and he was doing many, many things down in in Huntsville, or his people were, he brought a bunch of Germans over with him after the war. Mm -hmm. But it was an exciting time, and it was a time where money wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, later on in some of the programs that I worked, uh, money was, of course, now you're seeing, uh, I think, uh, I know uh, Lockheed Martin now is, is having problems on uh, uh, some uh, satellites that they're building because they're overrunning and so they're bringing in other companies to do some of the work. Hmm. But no, it was, a, it was a neat time. Did you have any one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, Pardon? Did you have any one-on-one -on -one meetings or uh, collaborations with Dr. Von Braun? I had one meeting with him. That was it. And as I recall, uh, it was how you would man rate solid propellants, solid propellant uh, vehicles. Because at that time, all his stuff had been with liquids. And when you were doing Saturn and that, that was a liquid. Or if you were doing Redstone, What was it like to present your work before him as, say, compared to Dr. Zucro? Well, Dr. Zucro, you knew, was in your corner. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Von Braun was very biased towards liquids. So you had to be very careful because you're opening yourself up to a lot of uh, uh, criticism. He, he was a very smart man. He was a very good man, but he'd try and put you, uh, well, he wanted you to go his way. He did not like solids. So. Um, you mentioned this, the shuttle program. Did you, could you talk about, did you work on um, projects for that, for the space shuttle? Uh, most of my career was involved with Mm -hmm. uh, when when we Martin first got involved uh, on the shuttle, we did a bunch of uh, paper studies as far as the alignment and all that. And and I got a bunch of that stuff in this paper. I, this thing I wrote for my kids. Mm -hmm. But uh, we would go. We went one time down to. 
trap hunts. So then we did studies on uh, are you going to have the uh, solids working in, in series with the liquids or are they going to be in parallel? And you ended up with a parallel uh, configuration where you had the solids strapped onto the core vehicle, which is you know what we have on Titan today, what we had on shuttle. when you look at most of the liquid uh, vehicles, when you look at the space launch vehicle that uh, NASA is developing now, the core vehicle is the liquid, and they're debating back and forth between solids and liquids as the strap-ons. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a neat time. Anyways, went from that, uh, then we... Uh,
that time, we were developing in the reaction control system, the RCS system for the shuttle orbiter. And that guided the orbiter around and uh, set it up for reentry and all that. And when I got assigned to that program, uh, I think I was the seventh program manager. Hmm. And uh, in a short period of time? We qualified it. It was on the first flight. In fact, all the tanks, stuff we made for that. And uh, it went very well. Rockwell told me at one time, they said, you know, Mike, of all the outside work we had done, your program's the best that we've ever had. We've never had a problem. When I uh, took over that program, I was told, you will not overrun. Well, later on, we had a new uh, vice president who later became the president of the corporation. We went out to Rockwell, and he uh, wanted to meet the people. And he said to him, you know, what can we do to do a better job for you guys on the uh, RCS tanks, and they said, tell Mike that when we tell him we want something done, we want it done now. <laughs> and I wouldn't do anything unless I had written direction, because that covered us financially. Mm -hmm. So I had times that I was in trouble. <laughs> uh, later on, uh, I was out, out at uh, Vandenberg, the Air Force had decided that they were going to get rid of all their launch vehicles, Titans, Atlases, and fly everything on shuttle. And then they had uh, the shuttle incident back in, what, 1988? I think it was 88, when the first shuttle went down. No Challenger, right. But they were building... Uh, a launch uh, complex there at uh, Vandenberg for the shuttle. Hmm. Well, after the shuttle went down, that and in many ways, I was out there for a short while. One of my guys was sick, and so I sat in for him. Then when the shuttle went down, I got to involved in that. Martin was asked to uh, head up, or not to head up, but to review all the stuff that had gone on on contracts that Marshall Space Flight Center had. So uh, I ended up running our shuttle return to flight program, which was about two and a half year program. Hmm. And that was probably the most uh, uh, interesting and challenging program that uh, rewarding program that I was involved with. Can you tell so us? That, ta was, that was neat. Can you talk a little bit about that, about the return to flight program and your role? Well, I, I ended up being the uh, program director. Mm -hmm. Initially, I started out, uh, Marshall had the solid rocket boosters, they had the solid rocket motors, and they had uh, some of the avionics, the propellant control system for the uh, uh, main engines. Martin did not do anything on the uh, uh, external tanks because we were making those. They wanted independent stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did that. And the details of, of that are in this thing I put together, okay. Tracy, so Great. when you get that, you can get more details on it. Okay. But the, that, was, that was a fun program. I had uh, people from our, from Denver, I had people from down at uh, uh, Orlando, I had people from down at the Cape working for me on that. That, that was a fun program, and I, I was met weekly with the people down at Marshall. Mm-hmm. And I assume you were given the resources you needed to to do yes, the, to do the job well. We, uh, did 
everything on time and we did not overrun, which is uh, amazing. <laughs> you think is your most that kind of covers the shuttle stuff and that's uh -huh. all in this paper I put together. Mm -hmm. So what's next? <laughs> Mike, do you have a question? Is okay. there? Yep. Um you you've had a, a long career. Uh, I I want to ask what advice would you have for our engineering students today here at Purdue? If you could give them a couple pieces of advice for their careers. Shove the problem under the door. They'd work in their little 
little cubby hole and slide the answer up. But the problems are so complex today mm. that you need to be able to express your thoughts back and forth. But I, I think, I, you know, when, when you start out, you're, you're trying to do everything and you want to make a lot of money. You, you, all this stuff. And one of the first things I put down and learned got to understand, I learned these things the hard way. Put your family ahead of work. Mm -hmm. Never hear anybody, and I know you've heard this expression many times, no one on their deathbed ever said, I wish I'd spent more time at work. <laughs> work is fun and meaningful, and it, it's, uh, it can be very, very gratifying. There's more to life than just that. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to surround yourself with really talented people. And with the difficult problems that you run into, at least that I ran into, it takes a team to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. Also, don't ask people to do things you're not willing to do yourself. And when I first started out, there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I already said you're not indispensable. Mm -hmm. I also learned that you have to look out for yourself. The company looks out for itself, not you. Uh, and I think it's probably better than when I was there, but uh, you, uh, the company feels they own you. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, finally, I think you need to have a passion. You need to have a passion for what you're doing. Uh, that is more important than making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I think that's excellent advice. Okay, what? What's next? Okay, um, to my last two questions. Um, what are your thoughts about the future of aerospace engineering and the future of human and unmanned space exploration? Well, I, th I think uh, first, uh, I think aerospace engineering still got a long time to go. There's so much going on. And, uh, but we're getting more and more automated. And so uh, you need to broaden yourself. You, you need, I, I think you need a little, you don't want to just say specialize in uh, solid rocket propulsion. I mean, you know, that's a pretty broad t topic, but you want, you want to have a, a feeling kind of across the board. You want to uh, do systems engineering. In the future of human and unmanned space exploration, it's going to go on for a long time. I thought at the time that uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan and those people were like landing on the moon, that uh, we would have uh, uh, facilities up there. In fact, when I was with the Corps of Engineers, you know, that short time, and Von Braun really didn't need us. So we spent our time studying how to build facilities on the moon. And here it is, what, 50, 60 years later, hmm. and stuff went for nothing. Hmm. But I think that there's going to be a future there. I think there's going to be a good future there. But uh, well, you find that the space program has provided more for the money spent than about any other program we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, I think there's a great future. Thank you. I'm uh, envious of the kids that are <laughs> going into that because there are going to be things going on that I never thought of. And I have to say, I can remember when I first started at Purdue, uh, Dr. Goddard, everybody thought he was a nut. 
Thank you. Okay. Anything else? My last question is, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think I should have asked you? <laughs> no, well, I was, uh, you know, in your letter you said don't, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to do any kind of preparation. Well, I did <laughs> in terms of, I worked a bunch of different programs. And I had the feeling that I was the one that always got kind of stuck. They couldn't find anybody to do the job that they wanted done, so I had to do that. Hmm. But it turned out that I learned an awful lot from that. And so I went and I put together a listing of my, my, my most rewarding uh, job assignments. And I don't know whether you want that or not. Yes, please. Okay, well, certainly the shuttle return to flight was number one. After I left uh, Martin, I uh, was invited over to China hmm. and uh, made two different trips over there. And it was for the Chinese, and it was about 20 years ago right now, 20 years ago, November. Mm -hmm. They had a solid propellant uh, kick motor that they had to develop for their AsiaSat 2 satellite. AsiaSat is a company out of Hong Kong that, uh, you know, they have the satellites up there broadcasting PE stuff mm -hmm. in that part of the, the world. And uh, I went over there with U.S. government people, because mm. when you do that kind of stuff, you want to make sure that you're not doing things you shouldn't be doing. Right. So I had Air Force people with me, but uh, first I went over there and we went up to, uh, uh, they called it Hershey, it's H-E-X-I, up in Inner Mongolia, in Hohut, where they did their solid propellant work. And they'd blown up a couple, so I was part of a team from Martin that went over there. And then uh, a year later, they asked me to come back and uh, do the flight readiness review for the uh, kick motor, the solid rocket kick motor, which was a neat experience. Mm -hmm. I like that. Another program that I was involved in was um, Amin Fuels, uh, specifically for unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, the rocket propellant that uh, Martin used on Titan was called Aerozine 50, which was a 50-50 blend of neat hydrazine and unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine. Unfortunately, the uh, propellant and the side products are carcinogenic. And anyways, we were working to develop a new process to, to make that that would avoid the carcinogens. The government had shut down the food machinery who was making the propellant. And we, Martin, were the largest users of it. Martin at that time had a, a chemical company they weren't going to touch it. There wasn't any money in it for them. So I got pulled in to head that up. And it was another time I started out a project I knew nothing about. Hmm. But it turned out to be a great project, and I met some really neat people. Then uh, the SPOM, the ducted rocket that I talked about at Tyac Hall, mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Running propulsion was nice. Uh, doing the RCS tanks was nice. Uh, I was part of tech ops and went to uh, Japan. As we started stuff that is now on uh, 
sounds like many of these were were huge challenges that needed to be overcome, and you, yeah, you. Sounds very rewarding. Yes. So, but I will send you this. Yeah, I've got, I've got your email address. I don't have Mike's email address. Oh, I'll be emailing you uh, just a hello and thank you soon. Okay. I have your uh, calling card, so. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to meeting you in person, I hope. <laughs> Maybe with Rita sometime. Soon. Okay, well, you know, I wasn't going to come back. This was going to be my last time back in Purdue. Oh. I had so much fun this time, I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, fingers crossed. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'd love to give you a tour of the archives because it's pretty cool here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I say so myself. <laughs> good. Well, thank you so much for yes. the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mike. And I, meeting you I made me think of a lot of things. Can I, so. Yeah, I enjoyed our conversation. And I, I'll so die. I look forward to meeting you again someday out at Zucro Labs. Okay, very good. By the <laughs> way, if either of you get back this way to Denver, I don't know whether you come skiing or, <laughs> or what, Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.